I want to move on now to look at uh, the, the equity market and equity market issuance. Um, and really, I mean, looking at the, the year so far, it's been a mixed year. We've had some uh, very big and significant deals, including VTV's own uh, secondary market offering. Um, but also, I think of the nine issues or so that were, that were mooted this year, I think several of them, maybe as many as five, have, have not worked out. Um, Jochen, is, is that a reflection of you know, general unpredictable market conditions worldwide? Is it something Russia-specific, or are there also sometimes company-specific stories that, um, that are you know, making it a little bit unpredictable as to how some of these issuances work out? Well, I think, uh, say, from our private equity investing activity, if we look at a deal and the person says, I'd like to cash out, please, we usually stop looking because you know, you know, we say you don't look into the mouth of a horse that is presented to you, but if you're supposed to buy the whole horse and own it and the, the management cashes out, that's the first thing that makes people nervous. And I think that's, uh, if people were genuinely looking for capital to grow their business, I think you will find bias and you come up with a fair price. When people are looking to cash out, I think it becomes more difficult. I like to say, is that it's often said that the Russian issuers are quite ambitious with their valuations. Do bankers sort of work to try and educate the issuers as well that, you know, try and meet the investors halfway and work out. Obviously, you don't want to do a giveaway, but equally, you do want to get the deal to work. Is there greater understanding of that feeding through, or are there still you know, some of the companies coming to market with kind of over-ambitious uh, view of, of what they can do? I would say kind of it depends on case by case, uh, as always. But uh, I would say that the, uh, the pullback of uh, a number of deals um, uh, year to date is actually a very healthy sign. It actually means that uh, the market is uh, getting more rational in uh, looking at trades and that disciplines the issuers as well. So it was very clear uh, that we had this uh, uh, stream of uh, transactions or the batch of transactions in uh, January, February and then informed by the experience of January, February deals, uh, the issuers which were coming to the market in April, May actually were uh, much more, I would say, open-minded and reasonable in uh, assessing their options. Still, some deals were pulled, but uh, again, it's, uh, I think it's the sign of the uh, growing efficiency and rationality foremost on the part of the buy side, uh, which uh, kind of uh, do their homework and are not ready to jump on the Russian risk just to be for the sake of being in every deal which is happening in the market. John, obviously you, you work with issuers to prepare for IPO. Um, what do you think are the major considerations when you're working with Russian companies that tend to come up in terms of the sort of the steps they need to take and the, the kind of where the biggest gap may be between you know, the desire to list and being kind of ready to list? Well, I think uh, you know, certainly Russian companies have been at it for some time, so there's a lot of uh, material already on the market. Uh, there are a lot of prospectuses for, uh, for companies to look at if they want to see how, how another company uh, has, has handled it and what, what they're disclosing. So I think uh, really in terms of the level of uh, readiness of, of Russian companies, it, it's, you know, it's there. People, uh, you know, people at the highest levels in the companies have a benchmark. Uh, so if it's real estate, and this year we had Etalon, uh, which uh, to pick up actually on Jochen's point, you know, the VC investor there actually stayed in the company. Um, and I think, you know, they're certainly, they certainly looked at other developers uh, that came uh, and positioned themselves accordingly. And uh, I think you can look at the result. They raised over $500 million. You know, I think Russian companies uh, are learning, learning, learning very quickly in terms of how to play the market. Picking up on Alex's point, again, I think, you know, just looking at the pipeline, if I compare this year's pipeline, uh, to what we saw in 2007, I actually see many more companies. What this means is that investors uh, have a lot more choice and they're going to push harder uh, on price. It's going to be harder to say, I'm a unique play. You can't say that anymore. Um, there are so many Russian companies out there, name a sector, uh, agribusiness, uh, energy, metals, utilities. There's another Russian company that you're going to have to benchmark yourself against. And Chris, I mean, when NVIDIA came to market, actually, you were a unique player at the time. I think you were the first uh, electronics retailer to list. Uh, and I think the company also went through quite a bit of reorganization before listing. I mean, what were the steps that you took? With what, how did you approach it? How do you think about it? And how did you engage with investors to sort of 
explain to them what the story was and, and, and get them to buy? Well, we had a lot of issues that we had to address. The first one was the legal structure. We had to simplify it because it was too difficult to go through and explain why there was this sophisticated legal structure that was out there. So we did a lot of mergers to put all of the companies to, into uh, one major company with a holding company. We had our property company separate, but that could be explained. Um, previous to that, we had had each one of our stores or each one of our cities as a separate company because then we could have uh, agency agreements and things like that, but these things were not things that you could explain very easily to investors. So we decided to reorganize, set everything up so that it was easy to do, easy to understand, the flows were easy, um, and after we accomplished that we had to set up the corporate governance, and, and I think one of the problems with corporates that are out there, they always think that the corporate governance should come after the IPO instead of before the IPO. Um, they all think that other companies are doing it this way, so once we do the IPO, we'll set up the board, we'll get the people on board, and then we'll be able to do that. But if we're not going to do the IPO, then we don't want that cost. And, and I think that uh, we as a company said that no, we, we need to set up, regardless of whether we do the IPO, we need to have an advisory board, we need to have all the corporate governance in place so that we can say we didn't just set it up for the IPO, we set it up prior to the IPO and the IPO was just a natural extension of what we wanted to do. Um, I, I think that I agree that one of the big problems that is out there with the corporates right now is when you're first to market, it's actually easier. You go out there and you explain versus international peers and even though we were the first to market in uh, Russia, we're not the first consumer electronics company that's out there that's uh, public and we were able to explain why we're different, why Russia is different. What you've got the problem with is other companies that are second, third, fourth, especially in the food industry, and they're all being compared to other companies that are out there. And I think that the owners of these industries or, or these companies are all setting themselves up saying that I think I'm as good as this company and I think my valuation should be the same as that company, even though it might have been public five years already. And I think the investment banks are also sitting there saying, yes, I, I think you're as good as this company and they're not managing the uh, client. Um, I think the investment banks are trying to get the uh, job and over-promising and then coming in and trying to push it down after that. <laughs> <laughs>